it should be uh, very inspiring and um, hopefully um, it'll create a lot of just uplifting thoughts for you. And um, we really appreciate all of you being here today. So um, my name is Athena Pandolf. I'm the executive director of the Natick Center Cultural District. And I'm here along with Archana Menon, um, the outreach coordinator for the NCCD. And she'll be handling all the, the chats today. And um, we are super excited to have with us Michelle Mercier from the popular podcast, The Resilient Entrepreneur. And Michelle has been an entrepreneur for a long time. And she has a lot of wonderful, inspiring, um, things to share with us today um, and how we can put ourselves at the top of the to-do list. And we also have the co-owner of uh, Five Crows Gallery and Handcrafted Gifts, Ginger McEcker, uh, with us today to share some information about or some insight about what it's been like to be a small business owner, a women-owned business in Natick Center. And then we also have Paula Dunbar from Paper Fiesta joining us. And uh, we're just so excited to have her point of view of, of what it's been like to open her own business as a women entrepreneur. And um, so thank you all for coming today and, and for being willing to share your stories with us on um, for our first ever WE event and um, especially on Women International Day. Um, first of all, we'd just like to open it up uh, while people are waiting for others to come in. Um, in the chat, um, if you wanna put your name um, and business and tell us where your business is located. Uh, are you a Natick? Are you looking to start a business here? And um, maybe when you um, became a small business owner. So this is where I need the music because um, this is where it's gonna, we need some background noise um, and feel free to share that with everyone. Thank you, Arjuna, for putting that in the chat. Uh, yeah, Kara is here and she opened the Elder Well Adult Day Program on Washington Street. So she's a wonderful neighbor of mine. That's great. People are still joining us. This is great to see everybody. We have Annie Lunston, the experienced alchemist, Wendy Tolman, uh, native resident owner and maker of Jean Ross candles. Nice. Deborah Mitchell, Papa Means, Deborah's been at some of our events. Rachel Manning, Obstacle Fitness. Oh, that's awesome. And Bev, great. So great to have you all here this morning. And Archana, feel free to, um, once, the, one, once people have asked all those questions, if you want to ask the second question, go right ahead, which was, what was your job? So the question is, what was your job before your women-owned business, uh, being a store business owner? Yes, thank you to everyone who's already uh, posting in the chat. We've got some wonderful answers. And we, since we're recording it, we'll also keep these chats and um, that will help us connect with you. So thank you. I know most of us have had many jobs in our lifetime. I know I've been everything from a nanny to a graphic designer to a legal assistant. So just a few, just a few things that makes us well-rounded as well as uh, other things. So great to have you all here. Awesome. Um, well, I, again, we are just so excited to have with us today, um, Michelle Mercier, and uh, she's been our guest before, and she just always has such wonderful energy, great insight, and just inspiring speaker. Uh, Michelle does have a podcast that we put in the chat, The Resilient Entrepreneur, and Michelle, we are just so excited to have you here with us today and to share with us how we can put ourselves at the top of the to-do list. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, do you want me just to jump in? Do you want to give it a couple sure, more minutes? I guess so. I, I mean, we you. can give them a few more, maybe one more minute, but I don't, I know yeah, people, well. you know, time is important and we have a lot to go through. Mm -hmm. So um, I did share my screen. If you want, if there's anything you want to put up or feel free. Okay. Fantastic. All right. 
So why don't we just jump in? Because like you said, we have kind of limited time and I want to make sure that we get through everything. Can everybody see my screen? I'm going to put in presentation mode in a moment, but I just want to make sure everyone can see it first. Um, and also just a couple of things, if you could just mute your mute your lines if you're not talking, just so so we can we can negate any background noise. Thank you very much for that. That's always appreciated. Um, and if for some reason there's anything in the chat, oh, thank you, Arjana, for putting my own stuff in there. I didn't even put my own stuff. Um, if there's anything that you need my attention for, anything like that, you know, Athena, just let me know in case I'm not looking at the chat. Um, so as we go through this today, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you again for having me here today, ladies. I'm just, I'm excited about, you know, International Women's Day in general. Never mind, you know, just getting to hang out with all of you. And I know Athena and your, you guys do an amazing job um, over there in Natick because I am over in Hudson. So I am always watching from, from you know, the sidelines at what everybody is doing. Um, if you could just mute, mute yourself, if you're not speaking, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Or Athena, I don't know if you can mute everybody as the host. There you go. Well, that's a lot quieter. Uh, thank you. Um, all right. So ladies, we are going to be talking at putting yourself at the top of the to-do list. And before I give any talk, at any time, I always like to give some, you know, some little small conditions around it. By no means am I like the number one guru at all this stuff. I have, I have some issues when people say like, here are the top three things, do these three things and you will be rich, beautiful, amazing, whatever the qualifier may be. So that's, that's my kind of first thing out the gate is I'm a very realistic person. I'm a little sarcastic. So please don't take anything I say personally, um, as well as, you know, I want to make sure that you take away from this what works for you, because I understand that all of us are at different points, whether it's in our business, whether it's in our lives. So, you know, just to kind of go through some things and take from, with, take from it what you will, rather. So like Athena said, before I jump into this agenda, a little background about me. I have a six and an eight-year-old, um, and I've been owning my business since 2016. And prior to that, I did a 10-year stint in corporate. And before that, I actually worked in the arts, and I'm a singer and a theater person. So yay to the cultural district on that and everything that they do. Um, but I know firsthand, and by no means, anything that I say in this presentation also, I tend to, we all tend to teach what we need to be taught. Right, so there's a reason why I work primarily with women and why I give presentations like this because they always serve as good reminders for myself as well. So again, I'm not, I'm not like this guru teaching you stuff. I'm teaching what I need to learn as well here, ladies, that we all need the reminder. So as we go through, we are gonna look at number one, the signs that you need a worthiness boost because oftentimes what people skip over in talking about self-care and kind of putting yourself on your own to-do list and things like that is if you don't feel worthy of it, you're never gonna be able to kind of overcome it, right? And do it. You see the same thing when it comes to old programming with money, you see the same thing in a lot of areas in life is if you don't feel like you deserve it, then I can tell you to self-care all you want in this conversation, but you, know, you may do it for a little bit and then it's gonna fall by the wayside because it's deeper, it runs deeper than that. And you know, to that point, we're gonna talk about self-care and how it's impacted by worthiness, like I said. We're gonna talk about self-care in the, in the frame, obviously, as a business strategy. I talk about that a lot on the podcast and a lot with my clients because I work individually with female business owners and some C-suite level people too, about, you know, it's not just about the bubble baths and the massages and the nice to haves, which I'm nothing against those because I love those when we are able to do them. Um, but, you know, really looking at it as a business strategy because oftentimes we will look at our marketing, we will take classes on marketing, on sales or whatever it may be, but we forget that if we don't function, the business doesn't function. And then obviously ways to increase it in little you know, tricks that I've learned over the years. So away we go. One of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown, and I'm sure many of you may have heard it, but there are no prerequisites for worthiness, period. Mic drop, anything you need to do to kind of accentuate that quote right there. There are no prerequisites. I hear it all the time. I mean, I've seen some of the most powerful women that I've worked with who hold you know, these amazing jobs run gigantic companies and they are still looking for the prerequisites and the things that will make them worthy. And the number one thing that I have to say back is you're worthy before your feet even touch the ground when you walk out of bed. <laughs> you're worthy the minute your eyes open. There are no prerequisites, there are no qualifiers, there are no I have to hit X revenue goal in order to feel worthy. You're already there, ladies. 
Okay, so number one sign that you may need kind of what I like to call a worthiness boost, or you need to look a little deeper than just trying to put self care in is, I see it all the time, not asking for what you want, and letting others drive your decisions. Now I have been I am 100% guilty of this, ladies, and I know we've all kind of sat, either whether it's at a table or on a Zoom or whatever it may be, and you know what you want. You know what can get you closer to your goals, but for some reason, you downplay yourself or you, you, know, you don't ask for what, what you want, even though there's nothing to say. Like, again, there's no qualifiers to say, if you have this, then it's okay that you ask. None of that. You know, so not asking for what you want and then also letting others drive the decisions. You know, there's often times I see women who have these amazing ideas, ideas that could make their businesses boom, right? And then one person's something that they said to them, one little nugget of advice that's given to them, something like that. And all of a sudden their decisions are being railroaded and gone in, different, gone in a different direction, right? Or you've got those voices in the back of your head, or, you know, some people call it like the itty bitty shitty committee, like in your head that's talking away <laughs> at you, you know? And they're driving your decisions, but you don't feel worthy of kind of stepping into that and saying, no, this is my business. This is my life. This is the direction I want to take it without a qualifier again. Next up is navigating away from the positive things or living in chaos or practicing self-sabotage, as I like to say. So one thing that I'm starting to see, especially with the last couple of years, um, and the level of chaos that we have all lived in is that, you know, when you don't feel worthy, number one, you've been given to kind of shrink. You know, you can come out, I've seen women who, who are amazing when they're running their businesses, they walk into their household and they shrink, right? Or, you know, there's certain people you shrink around or you navigate away from things going well because you are so used to them being, for lack of a better term, a complete shit show. <laughs> right? You're used to that chaos. And then to the point of when it starts to get too calm, you will sabotage it yourself. And that's one thing that I have some concerns about when we come out of this pandemic setting, because so many people have been, you know, either it's habitual, right? You are in this place where it feels more comfortable to be in chaos, or, you know, you really don't feel worthy of having that calm, of having success, there's a fear of success. There's a fear of good things happening to you. So they will, they will self-sabotage it. Um, but as you come out of the pandemic, be aware that you've, you've spent a lot of months now in chaos, potentially, in survival mode, in you know, catching as catch can, that you have to be very intentional and feel worthy of stepping into that next chapter that is calm or good things happening and, and stuff like that. So I see it oftentimes where, you know, it's like, oh, this looks good and shiny over here, eh, but it may feel a little too off, may feel a little too scary or not normal. I'm going over here. And I see that quite a bit from, from folks. And then pushing people away that you care about. So you sometimes have those good friends and I know some of us, you know, I may, I may seem like an extrovert, but I'm actually quite an introverted person when I'm not, when I'm not giving a talk per se. Um, and I know for myself, when I'm feeling like crap, when I don't like myself at all, I start to kind of, again, that, that fall in, right. And I start pushing people away. People are like, are you okay? Do you need help? And I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Go over here. And that's not about them. And I think that's the distinction sometimes when you feel unworthy that you need to make is folks may think it's them, that they did something wrong, but it's not, it's you because you don't feel worthy of that support system. You know, so you start pushing folks away. And then last and by no means least things that we are all probably guilty at at some point in time is not holding the space for self-care and joy. And I say holding the space because I'm not a fan of, you know, make time for, you know, because if we could all like snap our fingers and just like the waters would part and our calendars would be freed up and we could all go to the spa, hooray, you know, but I want to make sure that we are proactively holding space for self-care and joy. You'd be amazed at how many clients that I work with who I have to legitimately plan their joy. We have to plan, you know, weekends away. I have to plan you know, this Friday, you're going to sit down and watch a movie because they are excellent at planning for their business, 
but they forget that it's those joy moments or those self-care moments that actually um, build the energy up so that they can continue to move forward with the kick-ass business decisions. So, you know, oftentimes also I'll say it, you know, on the podcast or in other speeches, I'll say you need to infuse it. You know, you need to infuse the joy. You need to purposely choose it and schedule it in just like you would anything else in your life. So when you're not holding space and that's gone by the wayside, yeah, could you be just busy? Yes. But I would say a good percentage of the time when I've spoken to women, it's because they don't feel like they deserve for some reason to, to experience that joy. They feel like they need to li live, like in that previous slide, in the chaos. But that's just the lot that they've been given in life. You know, and then that kind of speaks to more of a victim mentality, whereas they forget oftentimes that they can make the choice. And another thing with this is that I ask, when I ask women in the first, the first client session, when I, when I have with them, I say, okay, well, let's map out your current to ideal state. You know, what is it that makes you happy? What are your goals? What do you want? And you'd be amazed at how many women cannot tell me what makes them happy. Um, which breaks my heart, <laughs> quite frankly, but I can understand it because I was one. And unless you are actively seeking out the answer to that question and kind of re-examining it from time to time, you forget that you're entitled to it. Another one of my favorite quotes, is, beautiful girl, take care of yourself because no one else knows what your soul needs. And I think oftentimes we get a lot of messages thrown at us. You're getting, you're getting some from me right now, right? But I'm not the one to sit here and when you leave this place, tell you exactly what your soul needs. You know what you need. You know what will sustain you. You know what brings you joy. Sometimes we just lose sight of it and you need to tap back into it. So worthiness with self-care. You know, why is self-care impacted by, you know, that feeling of worthiness? So when your worthiness is in alignment, you have that self-love. And I'm, I'm not talking about every single minute of every single day, because I think that's not possible as human beings. <laughs> um, you know, you're going to have some doubts. You're going to, you know, feel your way through some things. But I would like to see at least the 70-30, 80-20 split where, you know, you have self-love. You have a level of confidence. And the biggest part is that I am enough. I would say a lot of the things come back to the I am enough thing right? At the core part of you, you know, examine why you're trying to achieve, examine why you're doing certain things in your business, and make sure that it is from a place that you are not trying to justify that you are enough. Because you already are, like I said earlier, there are no prerequisites. But when you're feeling worthy of it, these are the things that are in alignment, and they naturally foster self care is, is you know, second nature, of course, I'm going to take care of myself. I have a friend who you know, does a lot of, she competes and does a lot of running and complete opposite of me. She's like 26 miles of a run. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. Um, that's not my thing. But, you know, it's second nature to her. She doesn't, when I'm like, well, what do you mean you can run? She's like, why wouldn't I run? If I don't run, I'm going to step into my role as an executive and I'm going to be cranky at people. And I'm going to, you know, not make decisions the way that I want to make them. She's like, so why wouldn't I? So to her, it's not even a, not even a thought, um, you know, and then again with that, there's no guilt associated with it. Um, the amount of guilt that we take on as women over things that we do not own, which we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit too, um, is remarkable to me and myself included, like I keep saying, is that, you know, we feel guilty if we go through a drive through at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. We feel guilty sometimes if we speak up in a meeting and maybe we made someone mad. You know, there's a lot of guilt that comes with us sometimes and being guilt-free and, you know, taking up space in this world, that is a form of self-care as well. So being, not being guilty for it and then understanding that you're worthy of the time with that. Okay, screen, if you wanna go forward, that would be great, there we go. Okay, so when self-care is impacted by feeling, by not feeling worthy, you tend to develop unhealthy and neglectful habits. I put this woman here, this picture specifically, because I'm the type of person who, when I'm like feeling like crap and stuff like that, I eat crap and I treat my body like crap. <laughs> and, you know, I look at it and I'm like, well, I don't really feel like 
you know, I deserve a salad or I don't feel like it's going to warrant anything. So here we go through the drive through before I even know it, I've downed like whatever the heck, you know, sh five shamrock shakes or whatever you want to do right now. And, you know, I'm neglecting myself. And for me in particular, I have a couple different autoimmune diseases. So I have Hashimoto's, I have um, celiac disease. So when my self-care slips, it's not just like, a, oh, I need to go take a nap. It is a landslide of issues. So when I stop putting myself, you know, even remotely on the to-do list, never mind at the top necessarily, but on it, I can't function, right? So that therefore, like I can't develop unhealthy and neglectful habits because my body got to the point where it's no longer a choice. You either want to function or you don't. So if you do the neglectful habits, you don't and you don't run your business and you don't keep moving forward and you don't get on calls like this with amazing women because you've developed unhealthy habits and you've neglected yourself. Um, gaining weight and putting your body last, similar to above, right? Oftentimes you've probably all heard people speak about how you know, weight gain isn't just about the weight. Weight gain has to do a lot with the holding of emotions and not being able to release and things like that. Um, so when you're, when your self-care is impacted, you know, and you're not feeling worthy of it, you know, this is a good example of this is when people will say, you know, I didn't go to the gym 30 days out of the month because I wasn't disciplined enough. Okay. Which sure, maybe there's some aspect of that, but oftentimes I flip that on its head and I say, well, do you feel worthy of going to the gym? Because if you don't feel like you're worth it, if you don't feel like you are worth stepping away from your family, you know, it's not going to happen working out. Right. And therefore you're going to gain weight and it's going to keep kind of going from there. Um, giving up your power <laughs> to a person, thing, or a substance. So similar to what we were speaking about before about defaulting to other people or letting their opinions influence you. You know, I see it a lot where women will just default to their husbands or their partners right? Like I don't have the brain space for that here. Brain space for that. If it's something that's important to you and it's something that impacts your worthiness or it's something that impacts your life, you need to make space and not give up the power to a thing, meaning a company, to a person, meaning, you know, a friend who is maybe not, you know, there to build you up or a substance. You know, there is the whole conversation about you know, drinking culture during the pandemic and stuff where a lot of people, um, you know, are joking about it, myself included, about, oh, I need, a, I need a glass of wine. I need to this, I need to that. There's one thing to be joking about it. There's another thing to be sabotaging yourself with it. <laughs> and those are two very different things. And that could be a substance like food as well, right? Like we said before, if you're giving your power away to a person, thing, or substance, meaning food, you know, that could be a snowball into neglectful habits and things of that nature, you know, and then you choose to numb or use escapism in a negative way. So when we're in pain, when we do not want to feel, when we feel we're not worthy, or we just want to not even be there, like oftentimes, I don't know about you, but I found myself quite a bit over the last year, you know, we, we will use different things to numb or to escape. And I say in a negative way, because I do believe that there is escapism with some positive outcomes. Like for me, pre-pandemic, my way of escaping was I'm a big person, I'd be at the movies by myself. Or, you know, hence the reason why Netflix binges are so big, right? And things like that, because you're choosing to escape. You need your brain to shut off, especially nowadays. But I think you need to be careful of how you're choosing to do it what you're choosing to numb yourself with. Because numb means that you can't feel the good or the bad. And I think oftentimes people forget that. So they numb themselves out and then they're like, oh, I feel nothing. Well, yeah, you're not gonna just, you're gonna feel nothing when you're numb. Good, bad, whatever it may be. And you're gonna miss the human experience. You know, or using escapism in the short term so that you have the ability to recharge with it. It is a positive thing. You are not running away. You're running toward clarity and not away from your stuff, if that makes any sense. 
And then I don't know how many people have read this lovely book. It's one of my favorites. Um, you know, when your self care is impacted by not feeling worthy and you neglect your health, like we said before, you can fall into dis ease. If you do not know what this book is, I suggest that you go and look into it. Um, dis ease is, is, you know, essentially what it sounds like disease, but dis ease, your body, your mind falls into dis ease. Um, and the interesting thing about this book is that she, she speaks about a lot of different ailments. And here in the direct correlation to stress, to negative emotions manifesting in your body. And, and for those of you who aren't like woo woo, as, as sometimes you say it is, um, you know, just think about the times that, how many times heart attacks have been attributed to stress or that crick in your neck that when you get so tense, you know, your neck goes out, goes out, right? So really understanding that if your self-care isn't on point or you're not feeling worthy of it, it's going to manifest. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I have multiple autoimmune diseases. And what is that the result of? Working 15 hour days, not taking care of myself, forgetting that self-care will actually help me in the long run and kind of pushing it to the end. So essentially my body fell into a state of dis-ease and now I pay for it. And now I know because one of my friends said, her, her mentor said to her that, you know, first your body will whisper, and then it will talk to you, and then it will scream, and then it will bring you to your knees. Which I think is a very accurate description of when you're not taking care of yourself and your body sends up all those flares and you're like, nah, now nah, just ignore that until it, it makes the decision for you, which I know happens to quite a few women beside myself included. Okay. I have come to believe that caring for myself is not self-indulgent. Caring for myself is an act of survival. Um, I'm going to read that last line again. Caring for myself is an act of survival. You know, and I, and I want to speak beyond the put your oxygen mask on first thing, right? We've all heard that. We've all kind of heard the, you know, put yourself first. And if it was that easy to just do it, wouldn't we all be doing it, <laughs> right? That's where I get frustrated where people make it so black and white. It's like, well, just do it. Well, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. <laughs> um, versus, you know, really re-engineering the way that we think about it. And oftentimes what I found is if we as women can think of this as a business strategy, as we can, if we can think of it as a supporting factor to the rest of the things that we do, then it's a little easier to swallow than, you know, just, just do it. Which again, we would all have done it. I know, I think it's tenfold if that was the case. Um, you know, and it was funny when I, the way that the name of this kind of talk came about was because I, I had written a blog a couple of years back about, you know, putting yourself at the top of the to-do list, you know, and at the time, you know, I was very kind of wide-eyed and like, well, just do it, ladies. Let's just all have bubble baths and go for massages type of thing. And I remember um, one of my dear friends reaching out to me and she was crying and she's like, Michelle, she's like, but what if I'm not even remotely on the list? Like, I'm not even on the bottom rung of it. She's like, and you're expecting me to, you know, leap all the way to the top. So for those of you who are not remotely near the top, it's about, you know, that progress. It's about a step forward toward caring for yourself as an act of survival. It's not necessarily an all or nothing, get to the top or not, or don't do it. It's a just making the forward progress. Like, what the hell happened with this? I don't know. Can you please mute yourself, please? <laughs> um, so viewing self-care as a business strategy. So number one, acknowledge that you're worthy of success. So many people I've run into, brilliant people, allow this kind of, you know, self-care or lack thereof or lack of worthiness to allow it to reflect in their bottom line. I don't know how many of you on here have had issues with setting your pricing feeling like you're worthy of whatever that price is that you are setting, you know, taking up space in a room, whatever it may be, but when it reflects itself in your bottom line, then it's a whole different story. And that could be that you are too tired to pitch. You could have opportunities and they're coming at you, but you're too tired and too scattered and too like, you know, brain dead to function through them, right? Affecting your bottom line. So just so you know, as well, when I first started, my business, I had a coach and he was kind of you know, the antithesis of what I really should have had in a coach at the moment, but I didn't know because um, I was new to it. And he said to me, 
you know, he's very much like a, he's, if you can imagine when you go to the gym and the people who like are yelling at you, do more push-ups, like one of those types of people, which is not, not my, not, not my jam. But I remember complaining to him one day and I said, well, you know, I can make a lot of other people money. Why can't I do it for myself? What is happening? I'm not closing deals. I'm not asking. I don't understand. And he said to me, he said, well, Michelle, he's like, do you feel worthy of making six figures? And I cursed at him, not gonna lie. Um, you know, and I was like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? You know, I don't get it. And then it clicked and I said, oh, if I don't feel worthy of it, I'm not asking for the price that I deserve at all, right? And therefore it's gonna, it's gonna hit my, um, you know, my bottom line. And then therefore it's gonna impact my business, which is gonna impact, you know, the, my ability to impact a larger amount of people. Um, and then be clear on what you own and what you do not own. <laughs> so putting your CEO hat on and standing in your power, ladies. So that is a form of self-care right there. All of these are. So when you are clear on what you do not own, because I have a lot of women who will say, oh, I'm so mad at this person. They did this. They did that. Oh, my goodness. I feel so bad. What did I do wrong in this situation? You know, and they spend a lot of the time thinking about what they did wrong or how something could have gone differently if they had just dot, 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 but they don't acknowledge what is theirs to own and what is not, you know, or if somebody has an opinion on your business, is that yours to own? Depends. Depends who it is. It depends on whether or not, you know, you feel supported by that person. But if it is someone just, you know, the internet is, is great for this on social media, right? You get, you get those comments from people or, you know, especially sometimes the people that care about you the most make some comments at you. And that's not yours to own. Everybody speaks through their lens of experiences and what, they've, what has, you know, been put in their path throughout their life. And it's your job to take what somebody says, put it through your own lens, and then apply what you want to apply. Right. And with that, putting your CEO hat on, and I don't care if you're a solopreneur or you don't view yourself as a CEO in the traditional way, but you know, you have a business to run. You have a responsibility. You have a bottom line to improve. You know, you have something to move forward. And if you let everything kind of get in your way and you own it all, you're going to end up, um, I heard on an interview the other day, caring versus carrying. Okay. It's one thing to care. And about what somebody says and to kind of run it through your filter. It's another thing to carry it forward into your business as a CEO. Okay. And then reject the idea that burnout is the default state of being an entrepreneur. Because it's not. <laughs> there are going to be seasons. There are going to be seasons. All of us know this pandemic has been one hell of a season where many of you have probably had to run a little faster, work a little harder, put more hours in or if you're building something or launching something, there is a period. But as we spoke to before, you have to be very careful that your lifestyle is not burnout as a default or 60 hour work weeks as a default. You have to be mindful enough to choose that, no, that's not the default state because there is that kind of hustle grind you know, mentality that has been put forth. Whereas I can see it kind of turning a corner where people are reminding others that time freedom is just as important as money freedom when it comes to being an entrepreneur and a business owner. And it doesn't have to be, I'm a big fan of, you know, quality over quantity. I don't want 12 hours of downtime unless there's quality behind it, right? Unless I'm, you know, purposely choosing that amount of time. So I would challenge you all to look at it and say, okay, am I busy for busy sake? Why are things on my calendar? Why have I scheduled them there? And how do they impact my bottom line or my visibility? You know, as a business owner and what, what's in it for me when I look at those things versus I know for myself, I sit down every Sunday and I try to, and I look at my schedule and I say, okay, when I assess every meeting, why is this here? Is it necessary? How am I feeling and am I burnt out? Because if that's the case and some of it needs to come off, but I'm refusing to acknowledge that burnout is synonymous with being an entrepreneur. 
And then ensure your body, mind, and soul can run the marathon of the business and don't fizzle out during the sprint. I see this all the time, all the time. And it goes in alignment with the one above that we just talked about around burnout. But also, you know, as a business owner, unless you are in a situation where you are going to build and sell, you know, and even then I would, I would argue that you're still in some sort of a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you really need to reframe your thinking to understand that what is the best in the long haul. And what is best in the long haul is ensuring your body, mind, and your soul on some level to make it to the finish line just as well as your bottom line does. Because for many of us, like if I get sick, I don't work. There's no, there's no replacement for me. Some of you may have staff or employees or something like that, but you know, my family doesn't function. You know, my cat doesn't get fed, things like that. <laughs> you know, so if I'm not ensuring my body and mind and soul can run the marathon that it takes to run a business, especially in a pandemic, then I'm just going to fizzle out at the sprint. And then I'm going to be back to, oh, well, why am I so tired? Oh, I'm burnt out. You know, all of those things. So you've really got to get clear on the fact that it's a business strategy to allow yourself to get to that finish line, maybe. Oh, goodness. Come on, screen. So ways to increase it. Right. And again, nothing, none of this is just do this and you will feel amazing type of tips or my top five tips for self care. That's not really what I'm going with. So what you're going to see here is just things that you can use. Right. But number one is plan for you. Plan it in, ladies. It is not an afterthought. If you're going to put yourself on the list, then you need to plan for it as if you're on the list. So, for example, my to do list, when I sit down and I plan, you know, my list for the week, it's a combined personal and professional list all of the things. I look holistically at my life, holistically at myself and, you know, plan that way. And then I remove all or nothing thinking to succeed. So remember what I was talking about before earlier with the example of, you know, in January, you see it a lot. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go every single day. It's going to be amazing. And then if somebody goes, you know, 15 out of the 30 days, even though they've never gone before, it's a failure. You went 15 days and you never went before. So that's just kind of a, an example of all or nothing. You know, or another way to state this as well is flexibility within the framework. So one of the self-care practices or the habits for success or whatever you want to call it that I practice is I have a, a standard podcast I listen to every morning. It's, it's snippets of different inspirational speakers and it gets my head to kind of in the right, the right position. Would I love to do that? First thing I do when I wake up in the morning? Sure but I have a six and an eight year old. So sometimes my life doesn't work that way. <laughs> so I practice flexibility in the framework and it's not, and I either do it at 6 a.m. or I never do it. It's not black and white, it's not all or nothing. And if you can view life itself in that manner, you know, that's a lot, a little bit more helpful as well. And then, like I said before, focus on bringing joy into your life. You know, I have, I have clients who, if it does not bring them joy, they will not do it from a business standpoint. And that may be, you know, sound kind of rainbows and butterflies to some people, but they're that serious about it. Um, I have another person who I know who joy is a, she calls it joy is a KPI. Joy is a key performance indicator. She's like, if, if my team is not, you know, 80% of the time enjoying stuff, um, then, you know, why are we going to do it? There's the, there's the business of doing business. You're not going to enjoy it all the time. However, why not try to bring it joy into stuff? Um, start one habit at a time and master it. Use a planner or calendar to help you track and celebrate your progress. So there's amazing, there's amazing things out there. Um, I'm a big fan of habit stacking. So, you know, just as, you know, we would brush our teeth, you know, put something alongside of that. So if you want to say an affirmation every morning, you stack it on top of brushing your teeth. But if you think about it, it took, took us a long time to get in the habit of brushing our teeth when we were a kid. It took you a long time to maybe form that habit of getting that latte every morning. So if you try to just rip it out of your routine without replacing it or without, you know, any sort of intention behind it, you may fall off that wagon. You may not succeed at building positive habits, you know, and also starting one at a time is key. I am a very, you know, guilty of being like this month, I will 
start exercising. I will be bringing in a whole new diet. I will be doing, and it's like the list is like seven things. And my husband is like, okay, I'll see you in two weeks and we'll see how that's going. So <laughs> I am telling you ladies, pick one, pick one and master it because it's not about the habit itself. It's about the momentum that you're building with the self-care. It's the momentum that you're building and saying, you know what, a lot of the times people will say drinking water is kind of your baseline one. And it's not about the water. It's about proving to yourself that you can do it. Especially when you've broken so many promises to yourself in the past, you know, I'm going to lose 10 pounds when you don't. And then you're like, oh, I suck. You know, just build that momentum and track it so that you can celebrate it when it happens. Um, and setting aside 15 non-negotiable minutes a day for you. This one came because I heard, have heard so many women say, I don't have the time. <laughs> I say it too. I don't have the time for myself. I don't have the time to, you know, self-care. I don't have the time for whatever insert here. You know, we have 24 hours in this day. It is preferable maybe you sleep eight of them. You know, you can do the math on how many are remaining. So for women who can't even find 15 non-negotiable minutes a day, I tend to call bullshit on. <laughs> Because that 15 minutes, it can be as easy as sitting down, drinking a cup of coffee and reading a book, 15 minutes. It could be doing nothing, 15 minutes. But it's more about building the intention around it and refocusing yourself than you know, hammering it in that 15 minutes. <laughs> it's not a discipline thing. Again, it's about feeling worthy of just 15 minutes out of 24 hours, guys, you can do it. <laughs> and then shutting out the saturation of quick fixes and external impactors. And I alluded a little bit to this earlier when I was saying, you know, I don't have, I don't have the secret. I don't have the, you know, get better quick thing. And oftentimes we see because of social media and different things, we, we see the quick fixes. You know, buy this drink, you'll be healthier. Here's my top five tips to, you know, living an amazing life. Great, but they're tips. They are not quick fixes because nothing in life is typically a quick fix. Especially if you look at and you examine how long it's taken you to get to that place. It's not going to just poof, be better because you read an article or because you know, there was something that you bought. So be very mindful of the quick fixes and the external impactors, ladies, okay? All right. And the last one is she made a promise to herself to hold her own well-being sacred. And again, I'm going to remind you to hold it, hold space for it. It's not make it happen. Um, it's holding space just like you would hold space to meet with your accountant, just like you would hold space to market your new product or whatever that may be. You can hold 15 minutes a day at minimum for yourself so that you're able to show up as your best version of your CEO and to self-care and to put yourself at the top of the list when is needed. Okay. And that is what I have for you today. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm always here for anybody who needs support with that as well. Um, so Athena, I'm going to, I don't know if you want to open up for questions. I know you have yeah, other speakers. Um, sure. I mean, just thank you. Wow. I mean, so much great stuff. I'm like trying to take notes and, um, but hopefully maybe you'll share some of those slides yeah, with us that we can send can. to everyone, but yeah, Absolutely. thank you. And just, um, it's just, you know, awesome to hear that, you know, we're not alone and we often think, I think we have to, you know, do it all. And, but it really, I love your point that it really just starts with, you know, our worthiness because we really can't care for ourselves until we really feel worthy of it. So um, and thank you so much. And um, I do want to make a plug for that book too. It's awesome. Her little, um, the, um, the one, the uh, you can heal your life is a great book and it has some great affirmations in the back. So that was great too. I'm um, sure. I mean, we, um, we can open it up maybe for one question or two, but we do have other speakers, but um, yeah, exactly. that was just really sure powerful. So if you want to, um, um, just unmute yourself and ask a question or um, put it in the chat um, for Michelle, but you see here how you can contact her and we'll give you that information as well. Um, if not, so. that's okay too. <laughs> you are the best. Thank you so much, Michelle. And if you're able to stay on, we will have some time at of the course. end too, um, but thank you again. And um, yeah. this is my time to, um, if everyone wants to take just a little break, um, we will, um, if you need to stand up or stretch or, um, you know, 
whatever you'd like to do, uh, please feel free. Um, I would just like to say that, um, you know, we have a wonderful offer. One of our members is um, Darcy Wellness Center and Spa in Natick, and they said that they were offering, speaking of taking care of yourself, 25% off of facials for those women who've attended today's event. So um, we will put the, their link in the chat, but just mention that you were at this event today and the Darcy Wellness Center and Spa in Natick will give you 25% off facials. So there you go, Michelle, that's for you too. And um, so we're really thankful for that. And uh, we wanna extend that to all of you here today. And I just wanna mention that um, for most of you do know, the Natick Center Cultural District is a nonprofit, um, but for those who are new and don't, uh, we do, this is our first women entrepreneur event that we've had, but we do support the local business community. We do run some events in Natick, such as um, Multicultural Day, Natick Nights. And um, if you want to know more about how we support the local business community, feel free to visit us at um, nativecenter.org. Uh, an individual membership is only $25 a year and $50 a year for small businesses. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so your uh, membership is tax deductible. Uh, but we like to think that we do help support uh, the local artist and business community in many ways. So um, thank you so much for that. And um, we have some wonderful speakers coming up. And um, I just want to, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, another uh, women, uh, woman-owned small business entrepreneur, uh, Ginger McEckern, is um, not only the co-owner of Five Crows Gallery and Handcrafted Gifts, uh, but she's also a, an amazing artist and has done some public art right near me. She painted the unconventional garden on Adam Street. And uh, she's going to share with us today her story and um, how business has, small business or owning a women, uh, small business had changed over the years. So, um, Ginger, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Athena. And that was, Michelle, a wonderful talk. I really appreciate all that you said, and it's uh, many good reminders in there to take care of ourselves. So, um, I guess I have the privilege of having been a small business owner in Native Center for 20 years. Um, had you asked me in 2002 how long it would last, I would have said, oh, two, three years maybe. Um, but here I am 20 years later. Um, I am the only original Five Crow left. Um, they have all moved on to other uh, ventures. We are all still friends. We all still talk and they're all still interested in the business. Um, I started with four other women. Um, three of us had uh, very young children in elementary school, and that is how we connected. And the other two came through yoga classes and other things like that. And we just started as a home show one weekend. Um, one of the girls said, I'm gonna throw my family out and we're gonna set up a gift shop in my house and that's what we did. And there were five of us and just our artwork. Um, and at the end of two days, we were sold out of everything in the store, everything in her house, except for one picture frame. So we sat down and said, gee, this seems to be something that might work. And we went ahead and two months later, we opened Five Crows. So it was, um, I, I have to say it was a complete blur I don't really think I knew what I was getting into. Um, thankfully, two of the women were very seasoned artists, had been working in other shops, so sort of had a good framework for us to start with. Um, and it was, it has been an amazing ride. We actually started in Athena space. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Denise Girardin, who's also an artist and now a studio mate, um, rented this space and the one next to her. And we sort of took over the smaller side uh, of the Eight Court Street uh, space where Unity is now another woman owned business. Um, and then we swapped spaces. We went into the big space, Denise went into the small space. Um, and then uh, Denise moved into a studio uh, behind the store and we took over the whole space. Um, and then in 2013, we made a big move to Main Street. So we wanted space for teaching 
Um, and that was a great location for us in the Debson building um, where the paint and wallpaper shop is. We're down the, down the row there from them. And um, that has been a great move. Um, the, certainly the pandemic has been challenging, but for me, um, much of the success is because I have partners. Um, I now have two other partners, um, uh, Marie Jeffrey and uh, Sherry Anderson, um, both artists. And it's wonderful to be able to share duties, certainly and also good to build each other up when one of us is feeling down. So that has been, that's sort of my own little, you know, my tribe that, um, you know, sort of keeps us going. But, um, you know, Athena sort of wanted us to talk about Natick and how Natick has changed. And certainly I've seen a lot of change in 20 years and I feel I've always had a wonderful group of artist friends and business owners that I've been able to, you know, chat with, work through things uh, with. But now for me, the um, availability of women in Natick who own businesses, that we have friendships and we are able to share tips with, and everyone is so incredibly generous with their time. And I think it is an incredibly supportive environment. Um, and I can't say that enough, that just walking down and visiting Paula on an afternoon just to say hi and see how she's doing or you know, popping my dog over to Jill at Metro Pets or what, whatever it may be, stopping in for, for anything has just been an amazing experience for me. And it has really changed. Um, everyone is generous with their time. Um, you know, we, we, I think, you know, the three, five crows now are, um, a little bit older, um, not as tech savvy as I wish we were. Um, many of my friends have helped me through a lot of that. Thank you, everyone. Um, but, uh, you know, we were, we had a new website we were struggling to launch and, um, Kristen Sundin um, from Sundin and Associates jumped in and took over and, you know, was able to weed her way through all of the, the technical stuff and launched our website for us. I mean, it was just incredible. The, the generosity of her time um, was amazing. So I think that, um, you know, not that male business owners aren't are fabulous, but there is a, a, a sharing that women seem to do um, more easily, I would say. And uh, I just, I'm so thrilled to be in the company of these amazing women entrepreneurs and their energy is incredible. And I'm just uh, really thrilled to have hung in for 20 years to, to see all of this happening. It's, it's very, very exciting. Thank you, Athena. Awesome, Ginger. It's so great to hear your story and to just hear how things have grown over the years. I'm so curious when you think about, wow, 20 years is, it's awesome. Did you have people who at that time were like, what? What? Why do you want to start a small business? Because at that time, Natick Center looked pretty different, right? I mean, the shops <laughs> were, well, wait a minute. It was what, a dry cleaner, hairdresser, no offense, oh. those are great shops, but I mean, it was different. I mean, what was the reaction of some people at that time? Like, well, I, was there, were there any naysayers? Like, what are you doing? If there were naysayers, I don't think I listened to them. <laughs> I, 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 had, I had been in a studio, so I did have my art. Um, I had a studio mate at the time who we had opened a little shop, um, you know, upstairs um, at 41 Main Street. Um, not very successful, I have to say, being up 37 steps or whatever. Not a lot of people came up to see us. Um, so this, you know, again, I never anticipated 20 years later. I just, I, I never, I didn't think that far in advance. So I didn't think it was a big deal at the time. I just was like, oh, yay, 
you know, good to be with four other women making art. Right. What could be better than that? You know? Well, and a lot has happened. And I'm sitting in your former space it's right crazy. now, which is awesome. But it also got ran into a by a car. Yes. Right? I mean, you, yes, the other side <laughs> where unity is. Yes. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ran into and it is amazing how many. It, it's great to hear, though, that you kind of didn't really think a lot about that. I think sometimes we overthink what we're going to do. So maybe you have a lot of support from family and friends. Yeah. 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 I think, and I think just knowing that, you know, two of the women were seasoned and, and knew how to handle the finances and the, you know, all of that stuff that I had, to, I had to learn all of that. They already knew it. So I felt much more confident um, than if I had been going into it myself or with somebody else that knew as little as I did. Um, it was, it made it easier. It made it much easier to have yeah, those. So those partnerships are so important. And I think, you know, we do often, I'm seeing at least as I get older, women competing less with each other and, and coming together more, you know, which, which I mean, we all have our moments. And of course that's not across the board, but I think that's wonderful to, um, you know, to really be able to, provide that for other women, just the support, you know, for one another. So it's, it's inspiring. It's great to hear your story. I do. I do think Athena that, that what you said is very, very true about women, because, you know, I think that um, we often think, oh my God, if another store opens, what's going to happen to mine? And oh, that isn't that going to be, you know, that's going to compete. And it, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, all boats are lifted by the rising tide and I've seen it. It's absolutely Paula opening and Christina and, and Jill, every, it all helps. It helps everybody. It, it really does. Well, that's a wonderful attitude though, Ginger, because um, that's really what makes, you know, a center or a business community what it is that we are. I mean, it sounds right. People have been saying it for, you know, over a year, especially with COVID that we're all in this together, but we really are. And, and, you know, I think we've seen those changes because, you know, you've got people like yourself who are, you know, inspirational, whether you want to admit it or not, you know, that really have done the work and, and are a great example of what's possible. So thanks so much for sharing that. And um, just for all the public art, be sure to see the things that Ginger has done around town. I can't hear you. Athena, I can't hear you. We can't hear you, Athena. I think as we wait for Athena to fix her audio, um, thank you, Ginger. That's very um, a, a very important perspective to understand business resiliency and the longevity of the business that you've had in Natick Center. It is not easy. And um, with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Paula Dunbar, who is one of the newer business owners in Natick. Uh, Paula, take it away. Hi everyone, thank you Athena uh, for having me. And um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Paula, I own Paper Fiesta here in Natick Center. Uh, a little bit of, bit of my background, uh, my parents immigrated uh, from Guatemala um, and back in 77. We grew up in Brookline, but the housing section of it. So we were, um, you know, they were definitely hardworking parents kind of struggling to put their kids through like the best schools and everything. Um, I've been in the retail industry for about over 25 years, I think. I started working when I was really young. I was a candy striper at the Newland Baptist Hospital. I um, 
was um, at the Galleria Mall at a card shop there. Um, realized college wasn't for me, it's not for everybody. So um, decided, I actually met my husband at Curry College, decided to drop out and just get into the retail industry. Um, I was at Party Favors. I'm not sure if anybody is, knows Party Favors in Brooklyn. I was there for 21 years and I probably left three times because back then nobody, well, especially my parents coming from parents who are, you know, Hispanic, retail's not a career, you know? Um, they wanted me to be either a nurse or a teacher and um, it, that was just wasn't for me. Um, during those 21 years, I tried to be a receptionist at a travel agency. I tried moving to Florida um, and another office job. And I just realized I cannot sit at a desk. I'm very like, like to be like constantly moving and grooving and stuff. So that's how I ended up back at Party Favors. Those three times I left, he kept coming and like telling me, hey, welcome back. So um, that's where I learned how to, um, I love the industry that I, I totally loved. I was there, um, I became a salesperson and slowly moved up to manager. And after that, it's a small business, family owned business, and I couldn't go anywhere and decided, um, you know, what was my next step. And I loved the aspect of buying. I love buying, I love shopping, I love creating displays, I love customer service. And I decided to start looking into places uh, to open up, I was like, you know what, I can, I can do this. I can go ahead and be a business owner. Um, I should actually kind of retract. About 15, 16 years ago, I was pregnant with my first child. I have a 15 year old and a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where the entrepreneur bug kind of hit me. And I'm like, my parents are from Guatemala. People love the cultural stuff. So I flew to Guatemala, bought probably $1,000 worth of products, came back here, and I don't know if anyone is familiar familiar with SOA open um, market. And it was, excuse me, it was a, it wasn't anything big like it is now. There's like tons of new buildings now. And I was, I built La Cajita. That's what we called it. It was um, the small box and we set up shop and sold, you know, products from Guatemala. Didn't make anything. I had a baby <laughs> and couldn't dedicate my life to that then. And then um, about 10 years ago, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead. I had my second child and um, I decided to go ahead and try the entrepreneur and a spirit again. And um, I had somebody came to me with a uh, with a proposal of opening up a shop. And I kind of thought about it, thought about it, thought about it and denied it. And I said, thanks for the opportunity. But. I'm not going to take it. And this person kind of said, you'll never be anything without me. You will, um, you'll never get another opportunity like this again. And that pushed me where I was like, you know what? Mm, I can actually do this. I can go ahead and be in a woman entrepreneur. I can be a mother. Um, I started looking into classes at CWE, which is um, Center for Women and Enterprise. I took their visioning course. I took their business planning course. And that set into motion and to like, oh my goodness, I can own a shop. Um, I surrounded myself with people who believed in me. Um, my husband being my number one supporter, friends who believed in me. I did have like a lot of naysayers, like mm, you're not gonna go ahead and do anything or they'll laugh. They were laughing at my dream. I had several people laugh at my dream because it's always been a dream of mine. So um, kind of took more courses. I ended up um, going to the MSB, ooh, forgot about it, MS. BDC, and I met my mentor there, whose name also was Paula. And she totally believed in me, loved her, helped me with the numbers. Um, and we started looking for places. In the meantime, it, it literally is like being an entrepreneur and opening up a shop. It's like a roller coaster ride. Like once I was approved for a loan, and, but I didn't have a space. Then I had a space and my loan, you know, was already like, expired and I couldn't do it so it was just like these ups and downs and um it was you know every single time it was just like heartbreak and then all of a sudden elation heartbreak elation but I'm here um I chose Natick because you know my parents live in Ashland and in order for this to dream to come true I we moved in with them um to help save money to help with child care and everything and uh I loved, I don't know if anyone remembers Barber Brothers down on 135. That shop was awesome to me. I absolutely loved it. 
10 times better than this because they were a florist, a cafe, they had such great gift stuff. Um, and they closed down and there was nothing else really like it in the native you know, area, Metro West area. Um, and I decided to go ahead and start looking for places. Um, so I called here, you know, back in the day, like I'd see like a four rent sign and I'd pull over, write down the number and several places I called around here in Natick and I finally landed here on the corner. I um, called um, who used to own the building, Stephen Wolf once and he called me back the first time and, and he's a very grumpy guy. And he's like, are those the only questions you have for me? And I'm like, uh, uh hung up with him, went looking for another place that didn't work out, called this place again. And he like turned around and was so much more nicer. And, um, you know, definitely like welcomed me with open arms, which, you know, I guess is hard to say from whoever knew him, you know, he was a tough guy. So, um, and now, you know, I think little by little, the community here has definitely welcomed us up with open arms. The other retailers here, um, Again, I'm constantly sending people to Ginger and I'm going Bailey's new and I'm like, go check out Bailey or, you know, Native, you want coffee? Native Common Cafe is down the street. And I think um, that community within the retailers here is so important to have because we're all kind of, um, uh, how do you say the word, um, supporting each other um, with one another and, um, you know, wherever one wants to eat and everything. So, um, and even, you know, the customers of community here, not only the retailers, the people living here have been, you know, so, you know, again, open arms and they, I love when they hear, oh, this is, you know, great. This is what Natick needed and stuff. And, and you know, I'm here all the time. So, you know, I love, I love what I do. And I hope that kind of shows when you come into Paper Fiesta. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Paula, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. It is great to have you. I put your um, Paper Fiesta website in the in the chat, but um, you know, your story is just inspiring and thank you so much for sharing it with us. And it's just so great to know that like you didn't let any, just similar to Ginger too, you know, you both had that resilience. Like, you know, people said like, what are you crazy? I mean, what are the, I'm curious, what are those people saying now? <laughs> I kind of don't really talk to the people who used to say that now because I didn't need that negativity yeah. in life and I don't need that negativity in life and they want to come I'm not going to hold a grudge like come on in see what I you know see what I've built you know so um yeah but I kind yeah, of want to sometimes go be like nah 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 but I'm not gonna do that <laughs> right right well maybe they'll see you somewhere on Facebook or Instagram and yeah. be like oh yeah I was totally wrong about her and yeah um and it is great I mean it's wonderful to have you in the center and it, it's great that you're part of the merchant community uh, Maureen right next to you at Stuki Jewelers mm -hmm. just said you're awesome and she's great too and yeah um we just have a lot of um you know um just wonderful businesses that we're just so grateful um, to have. So um, if anyone needs any information or if you, now we'll open it up to questions. Um, you know, if anyone has any questions that you wanna either put in the chat or you wanna just unmute yourself and ask these wonderful women, um, feel free to right now. It's, it's all up to you. This is all for you to encourage you and inspire you. And really hope that, that this has been a day where you found some, some nuggets you can kind of bring you know, with you in the days ahead and the years ahead. Anyone, any questions? Paula, I think one of one of our attendees have asked uh, if you could list the business courses that you took. Oh, from CWE? Do you yes. want me to, um, for Center One, uh, I took their visioning course, which actually helped with kind of visioning what you had planned in mind. So uh, it was, um, it was really great run. Um, it kind of like opened up like the ideas, like, my original plan was to do a little bit what party favors used to be, which is a bakery and a party um, gift section. So it's like a one all one stop shopping, excuse me, all one stop shopping. And with the visioning course, it actually helped me realize, you know what? I'm not the baker. I'm not the creative engineer of that. I'm more of like the buyer, and I love doing that. So it, it like made it more of a clear path on what I wanted to open up in the future. And then from um, graduating from their visioning course. I went to their business plan course, which helped me outline writing up my business plan. And um, I know there was another meeting with Athena and I actually mentioned it to you, Ted um, Field posted up um, how to open up a business on the Natick, um, uh, what is it, the it's, website it's here? Yeah. 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 And back in 20, what was it, um, 2010, they didn't have that. So 
I had to go ahead and research, you know, things online separately. And if you guys go onto the Natick, Natick website, there will go, it will list on how to open a business in Natick. It will list on, um, you know, what is available for rent and all the demographics where I didn't have that information at all. So this is a good fact. But yep, those were the two courses, that, uh, the yeah, two classes that I took from CWE. That's awesome, thanks. And Paula, yeah, that is a great um, resource with the Natick. Um, so we have the Economic and Development, uh, the Community Economic and Development um, Committee has a new website. I'm gonna put it in the chat. And then at the bottom of the website, you'll see there's actually, um, there's like a business guide and it's it's a really great resource on who to call, you know, occupancy permits if you need, you know, um, anything from the Board of Health as far as, you know, all that information, just all the steps involved. So I put that in the chat. And I also um, just thank you so much, Paula, for coming, all of you, just for being here and sharing your stories and inspiring us and giving us just some great insight, um, you know, as to what it's like being a, a small business owner and just ways that we can take care of ourselves and to put ourselves first. Um, and also, I just actually put, I put the, um, the Darcy Wellness and Spa information. If, if anyone wants to take them up on that gracious offer, Michelle's podcast is here. And then also I added in a little something extra because I do like podcasts, but I feel like this is underrated. It's called Encyclopedia Womanica, and it has short 10 minute podcasts about women. I mean, hundreds of different women throughout history. Um, and their accomplishments. And I personally find it very uplifting. And they have, it's, it's just a great podcast. I highly encourage anyone who has the time or you're in the car or whatever, um, and to do that, it's been really fun. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Archana for handling the chat. It's great. This was a lot of her idea to, to have this event. We wanted to have it last year and couldn't for obvious reasons. Um, but it's been wonderful. And so thank you, Michelle, Ginger, Paula, Archana. Thank you all for coming today. And uh, we will follow up with all the information in the chat. I will send it out to um, anything. And uh, one last thing, Archana, good point. Um, one word or phrase that anyone wants to put in the chat of what some insight that you've gotten from today's talk would be great. Um, just you know, something that might've hit you, um, just something that might've inspired you something that you'd like to take away from this event. If you want to put that in the chat, that would be great. And um, we'll let a few minutes, we'll allow a few minutes for that community. Yeah, we do have a great community in Natick. I will say, I think that I've heard that from a lot of people, not from this town. And I know I'm extremely biased to the fact that I think we have an amazing um, community, but you know, when you see the merchants coming together, you see the community, especially you know, during this pandemic, really supporting the small businesses and hearing from so many that they have been, um, you know, shopping and um, supporting that small business community more than ever. Um, it's really, really encouraging. And I know that uh, through the Love Project and all these different public art projects, um, we talked a lot about partnerships. That's been really important. And um, it's really what it's all about and just lifting each other up. So, um, if anyone has any last words from the panelists, feel free, but um, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, I will be sharing this recording and uh, we really appreciate you coming out. It's been a wonderful time and great to see everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, thank you Athena.